Welcome to P3, I'm Randall Mark. This is the show that explores the fascinating people, places and perspectives that make up our world. On today's show, with the rise in gang violence across Canada, the question remains, how does one penetrate these close-knit communities and get convictions? I talked to one of the top gang experts in BC. This is P3. Popular TV shows like Sopranos have glorified the lifestyle of gangsters. Quite often religion and politics come into play as gunfire and dead bodies litter the streets of Canada's bigger cities. For RCMP Superintendent Dan Mallow, fighting gangs is his job and has made him an expert on the subject. He's my guest in studio. Welcome to the show, Dan. Oh, thank you for having me. You used to be an undercover cop for 20-some years, you said, and now you head up this, this gang task force in British Columbia. And what I understand what you're doing is you're really tracking how these gangs are interplaying with each other to stop the conflict between each other. Because, you know, you would know ahead of almost anyone when a gang is going to put out a hit on somebody else. Is that really what you're doing? Well, I think you have to look at, Randall, at the fact that... Um you know, gangs really in, in Canada has, has become a lifestyle. It's not, it's not a one-off. It's not going to go away. Uh, it's not referred to sometimes in the media as being a war. Um, these are lifestyles. These are, these are some of our young kids that have grown up through high schools. They've gone to jail together. Um, gangs like the Red Scorpions, the two individuals met in jail uh, when they were 16, 17 years old. And uh, we know from the past what, you know, what that's caused. How, so. how big are these gangs? I mean, and how close-knit are they? How many people are involved in one of the, in these, these gangs? Well, there's sort of different levels of gangs. There's a street-level of gangs that we see that really feed that insatiable appetite, uh, normally drugs, right? So mm -hmm. the people that buy drugs, uh, there are dial-a-dope operations of, of kids, really, 18, 17, 18, 19-year-old kids that are being abused by these gangs. And they work 24-7, they, they deal drugs on the street for the middle-level gangs. And the middle-level gangs are sort of those gangs that have been around for maybe the last four or five years. Mm -hmm. They've taken, you know, a bit of a stronghold. They really want to be like the big gangs, the gangs that have been around for a long time. They, they sort of look up to sort of that structure there's of, a hierarchy uh, of, gangs. of gangs. Absolutely. And, uh, and then from there, there's the traditional organized crime that we know of, uh, Things like the Hells Angels, the Asian organized crime, uh, you refer to the Italian Mafia, uh, traditional organized crime, Eastern European organized crime. And these are still alive and well in Canada. And they're, uh, yes, they are. And, uh, and, but they've, they've sort of matured, those gangs. And if you look at, you know, uh, we like to study the gangs, that's what we do for yeah. a living. And, and if you look at that, the, the gangs are sort of at the higher level, you know, went through that pattern. They, they, they came, they met. Uh, some of them came from other countries. Uh, they figured out where to make their money, and then they mature as a gang, and they, they, they become organized crime rather than the gangs that we deal with. And the gangs we deal with are the ones that are trying to get a foothold. They're trying to get okay. a piece of the stock market in drugs and other, other commodities. And really, the only way you can do that is not in a boardroom. You've, you've got to impose your own power. You've got to take over other people's uh, territory. territory, and use money. violence. And that's the only way they can do it. Uh, you know, some of these gangs try sometimes, which is actually kind of strange, but they'll actually try to meet somewhere and they'll try to come to a compromise. No way. And we they hear like, about those. Hey, let's meet at Starbucks and have a chat. And how, let's have the gangs yeah. go on. And hey, what if you had this area and I have this? No, that actually happens. Yeah, well, what happens is uh, most of these mid-level gangs pay money for protection and they pay okay. money to tax to the people that they can acquire the drugs from. Hey, well, well, you just right? say, you, so, you're telling me that the big top gangs, like Hells Angels and other ones, will tax other gangs to, for, the, for the ability to deal drugs? It's actually the right to deal uh, in right. certain, certain communities within that organized crime world is that there's a lot of money to be made. So uh -huh. within the different tiers of organized crime, the, the people that, um, that are sort of more mature that I talked about will have a territory and they'll have a, a, either a big city, they'll have a, a portion of the big city or in small towns, they'll actually be the people who, um, who give the right to distribute drugs Amazing. within a small town and they get a percentage of that uh, product profit for the right to allow you to sell within that community. It's, it's crazy. I mean, it's like how it it's really organized like a corporate structure would be. Uh, Dan, what about, I mean, you're telling me you have, you know these people. It's not like, I don't know who they are. You know them, they know you, you chat with them. 
Uh, I mean, is that, I mean, how, how often are you interacting with them? And are they, when you walk in and say, hey, hey, Officer Dan, I mean, how, what kind of relationship do you have with them, uh, these gang members? Because obviously they know you. Well, I mean, they, they know uh, I, there's a large portion of people that work uh, from all the different police agencies in British Columbia work within the Combined Forces Special Enforcement Unit and, and the gang task force that's part of CFSU. Mm -hmm. and, Within that, uh, these investigators do this for a living. I mean, they're very passionate about what they do. They work really hard. They work, uh, you know, 50, 60, 70, sometimes 80 hours a week. Uh, they, they interact with the gang members. Uh, we, we, you know, we have both investigators that are plain clothes that, you know, that you don't see in the community. We also have the uniform gang task force as well that are out every night, and they have gang, gang task force written on their backs. They wear a uniform. You'll see an RCMP officer with and a Vancouver PD. they're putting themselves PD. in the line of fire, in, in a sense. They're yeah. trying to protect the community from uh, any chaos that might erupt. Yeah, I mean, what we pay attention to mostly is conflict, right? So within the yeah. gangs, we know they exist. We know who yeah. they all are. There's very few major violent issues that happen. I can't think of one since I've been there that I've stopped and paused and wondered why. Mm. So, we, I mean, if somebody's killed on the streets of uh, the lower mainland, uh, we usually know who they are. We usually know what conflict, we know what gang they belong to, we usually know what other gangs are going against them. I mean, to bring it from there to a proof, right. you know, of a level for the court system is a different, you know, right. it's a different I mean, story yeah, that's, the, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, the rubber hits the road with most people is this. One, some people say, listen, let the dogs fight each other. If they're killing each other, we don't care. But the problem is, like the Surrey 6 incident that happened last year, we have innocent people being get caught in the crossfire and being killed. Uh, how do you get convictions of these people? Well, it's, uh, the level of, um, of proof is very high, and uh, sometimes it takes uh, a year. It could take 18 months, two years to investigate a crime. It could take a couple million dollars and uh, 20, 30, 40 investigators that, uh, maybe one that do homicide. just that. Uh, for one violent uh, right. crime, whether it right. be a homicide or, or uh, uh, another violent uh, crime that takes place uh, in the community within the gang environment. Uh, it, it, it requires the same amount of people, about the same amount of money. So the, what we know and what we bring before the courts are obviously two different things. So, you know, our intelligence um, model that we have in policing is very strong. I mean, I know, we, you know, sometimes you get criticized of that. Uh, we talk uh, within the gang task force itself. I have nine different law enforcement agencies that work there. Um, these folks get along really well, and they exchange information all the time, and uh, we have, you know, in, informants within the gangs that we know who they are and uh, we know what they're are doing. Are these paid informants? Uh, you yes. pay these guys to give you information? Yes. And if, if they're ever caught, my goodness, I mean, they'd be, if they're, you know, if their gang discovered that they were a rat, it'd be the end. Well, you know, gangs know that, uh, that you know, they get infiltrated by, right. by people and they know that the police have an intelligence model uh, in place. I mean, that's not... Wow. Uh, that's, that's been around yeah, for it's been around. forever. Of course, that's how so, you guys uh, you rely on that. Let's take a quick break here. But I'm really interested in some of the issues of, of how these are the politics and even in how religion sometimes factors into how gangs get made up. So mm -hmm. let's stick around some more with Superintendent Dan Mallow when P3 returns. P3. I'm again joined in studio by RCMP Superintendent Dan Mallow. You are in charge of the 16 different agencies, about 450 gang task force members that are trying to deal with the issue of gang violence in British Columbia. You were telling me that there's been a glamorization in the media, movies, these other things, that how cool gang life is. I'm driving the fancy cars, I've got the bling, and yet the reality is you go up to doors, knock on the door, and say to an 18-year-old kid, by the way, I know it, in two weeks you're, you're, there's a hit out on you, you're going to die. Uh, that's, that's uh, I mean, it's a sad comment, but it's true that, uh, that uh, quite often that we'll, we'll receive some information about a gang member that's... Um, in all likelihood going to get shot and killed in the next uh, sometimes days or weeks. And, uh, and the, the difference between, you know, perception of what uh, some of our younger folks see as, uh, as glamorization of, you know, being able to buy the $300 t-shirts and $400 jeans and drive the nice car and go to the nice bars and restaurants compared to what we know when they become involved in mm -hmm. things like the drug trade and how they're abused and how there's, you know, a good chance that they'll be a victim of violence. And uh, we've seen, you know, how many of our gang uh, members have been killed in the last couple of years, and that doesn't seem to resonate for these kids. They, they, it's they, worth they the risk to, to them? 
they don't care? Is it, is, it, is it cool to be, yeah, there's a hit out on me? It's, woo, yeah. Well, it's a lifestyle, right? So they see that lifestyle. They see the fact that, you know, they can belong to something, that they can be the man for a period of time. But they don't see the fact that they're not going to do that for 30 years. Right. I mean, the chances, uh, the, You're the average You're not raising a family age, on that. No, and the average age of a gang member who's killed is 27 years old. So, I mean, some gang members make it past that. Some of them don't. Yeah. And, uh, and, and like I said, most of them are somewhat predictable for us, that we know that, um, you know, some gang members rip other gang members and steal their drugs and steal their money. And, right. and there's a number of different conflicts that take place. And all those conflicts generate a potential of violence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for some reason, the younger kids that we try to talk to just... They don't get, to doesn't get into the brain. There's something unique happening on the West Coast here with the South Asian gangs. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people used to think, you know, what's with these, this, they call them Sikh gangs. But, I mean, are they connected with religious uh, overtures? Is there a kind of Khalsa uh, state idea in their brain? Are these just young kids like any other gang members? What's the connection between these South Asian gangs and the Sikh culture? Well, I mean, it is very much... Um, it, the way we look at it is not necessarily the religion part of it. You bring it back again to the lifestyle. And, and within uh, parts of the South, South Asian community, there's, uh, there's some big prestige in being the man and being able to, you know, to have the big house and the car and to try to get there very quickly. Mm -hmm. And one way to get there very quickly, it, unfortunately, is through um, illegal means. And, yeah, and that's sad uh, and, because and they parents, jump into that. Their parents you know, come, have come over here from India, let's say, yes. and have worked for years and years and years in yes. farming and in industry and have done incredibly well yes. and now these kids want to hand it on a silver platter and is that you're, you're feeling that happening? Um, there, there's part of that, there's part of the I, I need to get there very quickly mm -hmm. and I need to, to make an impact within my own community on who I am. The other part of it is that we're dealing with now is second and third generation Canadian mm -hmm. uh, that came from uh, the South Asian, South Asian countries that are now here where the parents uh, and the, the older brothers that are well-established criminals, uh, their, their younger brothers are now becoming part of this, uh, of this lifestyle because they see that that's a, a way to a means, uh, means to an end that, um, that really is quite artificial. Do you ever find a connection between certain gangs and, and religious groups, uh, almost terrorist uh, kind of religious groups? Well, there is, uh, you know, within the national security environment uh, of policing, uh, they deal with that. But what we deal with, again, is, is more the, the, the conflict associated to the mid-level gangs, those gangs that I, that I talk about that, you know, try to take over other people's territories yeah. and, and things like crack shacks and, uh, and dial-a-dope operations where they're making their money. So we don't necessarily target the religious side of it. Mm -hmm. But, but within the um, South Asian community, it's well documented. In fact, that's the push that started the BC Integrated Gang Task Force uh, six years ago that led to uh, the task force of today. Is there, I mean, a lot of people, this is a debate, saying, listen, drugs are fueling the gangs. That's really what's, you know, where they're getting their money from. If we legalize marijuana, the $6 billion industry, we could really have a better handle on, uh, it wouldn't have the same kind of means. Do you agree with that or disagree with that? I absolutely disagree from what we see and uh, because it's a commodity you have to you have to move it away from the actual commodity to the lifestyle so these people have decided that um, that they want to get to that very quickly and whether it be marijuana they're gonna if if we have legal marijuana at six percent THC is yeah. tetra to hydrocannabinol which is the ingredient makes you high they'll make 14 percent if we if we sell 14 percent they'll make 20 percent uh, they'll look for other ways of, of trafficking in other drugs. They'll, they'll traffic in people. They'll look at uh, uh, internet fraud. They'll look at counterfeit credit cards. Mm -hmm. They'll look at swipe cards. And so you're saying that's not going to solve like the problem? It's, 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 it's not a commodity-driven thing. This it's is a, a big lifestyle. issue. Uh, Dan, we only have a last uh, a minute or so. For you, what is the, the main thing you want the public to understand about how complex this, the gang world is in Canada? That it is a lifestyle, that we have to keep pushing it uh, to, to make sure that our kids, there's a lost group there that, that we have to just take and throw in jail. There's the other group that we have to spend time, which is our younger kids, and really take that shine away and, and tell them the truth behind what it is to be a gang member and really educate through our school systems, through our families, that it's not the glorified uh, end result. And, uh, and we don't see that because, uh, you know, we have police officers that go to the scene of these murders all the time. We look down, we know who they are, and it's really not it's what, uh, what it is.
It, it I mean, is. that must be one of the saddest things to go up to a parent and say, your 19-year-old son, your 20-year-old son has been shot in a gang violent murder. Uh, who, who, the, who the parents know oh. couldn't afford that car, couldn't afford that house, couldn't afford the business, nah. doesn't work. Um, you know, the families of the real bona fide gang members know full well what these wow. people are involved Dan, in. Dan, thanks for all, the, all, you do, all you do in our community and in British Columbia. Thanks for keeping our streets safe. You're welcome. All the best. Coming up next, more P3. Make sure you check out our website for your favorite archived interviews and a schedule of upcoming shows. Also, if you have a question or comment, drop us an, e an email at info at p3tv.ca. Thanks for watching. I'm Randall Mark.